Welcome everyone. We're going to take just a minute to let everyone um, enter the, the Zoom and then we'll get started. Welcome everyone. It's wonderful to have you here on a Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll start, this is where you would be coming in, grabbing a cookie and sitting down. So we'll, we'll let people do that for a minute while I just welcome everyone. This is the second talk in our semester long series on migrations that we have this fall. And I won't go over this every time uh, we have a talk or every week, but I did wanna start off because we're still early in the semester and just remind everyone that these talks are part of the university's Global Grand Challenge on migrations. And so if you're not familiar with the Global Grand Challenges, I'll put the um, website in the chat. It's the university coming together to think about what are some of the greatest challenges facing the planet or humanity today. And in a, a series of events in 2018, 2019, we selected the topic of migrations. We think of migrations, not just in terms of the movement of people, but in terms of movement of people, plants, animals, microbes, you can think of now, and the context and uh, in which they move and the implications of that movement. This initiative brings together colleagues and partners from across campus and beyond to think about and really try to transform the way that we study, research, and engage on issues of migration. So hopefully you've taken a look at the list of speakers for the fall. It's a very wonderful group, very interdisciplinary. We have speakers from ILR uh, today with Shannon from history, from law, from the life sciences, from architecture and city and regional planning and public health and medicine. We hope to see you on, on Wednesdays. Um, we hope that you'll make this a regular event and we're thrilled to have one of the kickoff talks by Shannon Gleason today. Shannon is the co-chair of the Migrations Initiative um, and it's wonderful to get to hear her talk. So I'll turn it over to Alexis Fintland to introduce Shannon, but I'll just say too that there is going to be a talk and then time for questions and answers and um, there is a Q&A button and there's this cool feature, which I haven't seen before, so I'm excited, where you can um, vote for a question to be answered. So if you click on the question, it upvotes, um, and then we'll know that that one is particularly popular and, um, and give that one to Shannon. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you, Shannon, and over to Alexis. Hello everyone, my name is Alexis Fentland. I'm currently a junior in the School of Industrial and Labor Relations pursuing a minor in Migration Studies. And today is my honor to introduce Professor Shannon Gleason. Shannon Gleason is an Associate Professor of Labor Relations, Law and History at the Cornell ILR School. In addition to this, Professor Gleason serves as a co-chair of Cornell's Migrations Task Force. Her books include Accountability Across Borders, Migrant Rights in North America, Precarious Claims, The Promise and Failure of Workplace Protections in the United States, and finally, Conflicting Commitments, The Politics of Enforcing Immigrant Worker Rights in San Jose and Houston. Her other work examines the role of civil society and local governments in implementing the 2012 Deferred Action of Childhood Arrivals Program. Her work also studies the impacts of temporary legal status on immigrant workers with Professor Kate Griffith, as well as the responses of the labor movement to immigration policy under the Trump administration. Interestingly enough, I currently serve as a research assistant for both Professor Leeson and Professor Griffith, 
In my role, I help transcribe and code Spanish interviews of migrant workers discussing how various legal statuses impact their work experience. These interviews are then used as sources that you can find in Professor Gleason's research. My interest in this position builds on my previous experiences serving as an intern for the American Immigration Lawyers Association, as well as an intern for Senator Kamala Harris, where I conducted policy research informing legislation protecting undocumented immigrants. I highly encourage anyone who's interested in pursuing similar projects to learn more about the ILR Worker Institute, where Professor Gleason, Professor Griffith, and I conduct our research. I would like to now remind the audience that there will be time for questions, and we will use the Q&A function that is located below in the Zoom webinar. Without further ado, Professor Shannon Gleason. All right, thank you, Alexis. I really appreciate it, and it's a real pleasure to be here today talking about a really important topic. And um, I'm actually not teaching this semester, so this is a great opportunity to engage with students and the broader community. So just give me one second to get my slides up. Okay, so let me know for some reason that um, slideshow is not showing on your end. Um, but I am gonna get started right now to first tell you a bit about the project um, that I'm engaged in with Professor Kate Griffith. Um, I, as Alexis mentioned, work on a number of different fronts thinking about the intersection between immigration policy and worker precarity. But today we're gonna to focus on one specific piece of this based on a collaboration that we have ongoing in New York City um, with two main communities of immigrants, um, the Haitian immigrant population and the Central American immigrant population. And I'll say more about that in a second. So to start, um, I want to kind of think through what the current context of the immigration um, policy situation is in the United States. I was joking before we got on that um, it's very possible that all of this could change in the five minutes or in the time that we're on um, the line here today because it has been moving at a particularly rapid pace compared to previous administrations. And so what I wanna say in, the, in my beginning remarks here is to kind of situate what do we know about the current immigration strategy, but I also wanna be careful to not essentialize um, some of the key dynamics that I'm gonna to be touching on today to only the last close to now four years. In fact, I would argue that what we see here based on our research is really a culmination of multiple administration strategy around immigration. And so some of the things that you might be hearing about in the news include things like the increasing border militarization at particularly the Southern border, although certainly here in upstate New York, we have a taste of what that looks like at the Northern border, but certainly in the news, most of that emphasis has been on the southern border and Latin America in a very racialized way. And also there have been a lot of um, litigation and direct actions regarding the various iterations of the Muslim ban, also known as the travel ban. And although it does also um, target Venezuela and North Korea, the overwhelming number of countries targeted by this um, restrictive policy, set of policies are from majority Muslim countries. Um, and there's been attacks on the asylum process, both at the southern border um, in terms of individuals coming to um, request asylum, but also we see um, a gumming up in the court system, especially now during the current pandemic. There's been a bit of, of, of changes, certainly that individuals who are advocating on behalf of immigrants have had to face in terms of how the court system is working, delays, backlogs, et cetera. And we know that there are going to be long-term impacts of the slashing of refugee admissions policies and what that means for local communities, including here in upstate New York, like Buffalo and Utica, which have been welcoming places for refugee populations. Other changes include um, things like an emphasis on public charge provisions. Um, my colleagues, Stephen Yaler and Jackie Kelly Woodmer at the uh, Cornell Law School have talked about this and I commend to you a webinar that they have on their website regarding those recent changes and what that means for low-income immigrants who are attempting to use benefits that are afforded to them, um, but are now increasingly becoming a risk category if they hope to one day uh, transition to legal permanent residence. And, the other piece of this that I'm going to touch on today has to do with not only what's happening at the southern and northern border, but also in interior enforcement partnerships, what that means both for partnerships between the federal government and local governments, as well as relationships with 
private actors like employers. Um, and so through this period, we've also seen that the impact on immigrant communities have included things like the increase, increase and qu more quick um, deportations, concerns around due process, concerns around the ability of the court system to fully examine all the um, rights that could be afforded to immigrants who are fleeing um, persecution in their home countries, and also an emphasis on our campus on international students, not only those who have deferred action for childhood arrivals, which has been in the courts recently, which has been a, um, a really important program for young people, especially in higher education, but also other programs like the one I'll talk about today, the Temporary Protected Status Program, as well as um, concerns around international students. So all of these things are happening in the same policy space, and it can be really hard to parse apart what is specific to the current administration and what do we see as a continuation from the previous. And while I won't touch on this um, it, too much today, I think the current pandemic has also put additional pressure not on the, only on the bureaucracy, um, for processing immigration, but also on the efforts of advocates to try to help individuals who may have lost their job, are facing health concerns, et cetera. So we can talk about that at the end, but today I want to focus is in particular on the work site. Um, and I want to also highlight that this is a time where there's not only a lot of political debate, but a lot of social movement action happening, not only within the labor movement. So I am a faculty member in the School of Industrial and Labor Relations, and some of my work also looks at how immigrant activists have long been targeted, including those who may even have some form of temporary protection like DACA. And certainly we've seen labor campaigns become targets of, um, of deportation campaigns as well. So we can talk about this um, in this broader political and social movement moment, but I wanna bring us back to the specific bureaucracy that immigrant workers find themselves in. And when I talk about immigrant workers, I don't want us to only think about immigrant workers um, who may be out of status, certainly about now 10 and a half million individuals in this country lack um, legal authorization to be present or to work, um, and about uh, 8 million of those are in the labor force. On average, we think that about 5% of the civilian labor force is undocumented, and that's been a big part of our conversation. But as you'll see throughout my um, talk today, it's not just the permanently undocumented population that is of interest, both from a scholarship point of view, but also from advocacy, but it's also the broader population of individuals who are being subject to the immigration enforcement bureaucracy, even though they may have some form of legal status. So I'll talk about that. So as I mentioned at the start, um, this is joint work that I've been doing with my colleague, Kate Griffith, um, professor and chair of the Labor, His Labor Relations um, Law and History Department at the ILR School, and she's a legal scholar. I'm a sociologist, and we've been working with a fantastic team of research assistants, including Alexis, to think through um, what are the ways in which immigration policy and labor and employment policy, what Professor Griffin refers to as employment law, how does that impact individuals at work? And I always like to start with this slide because it helps us to kind of deconstruct what do I mean when I talk about immigration policy at the workplace? And I want to start by thinking just for right now about the, the federal government. We know that in this country we have federal, state, and local arms of the government doing all sorts of different things, and we can get into that in a second, but let's just start by thinking about how does the United States think about um, undocumented immigrants in particular, but also a whole range of immigrants who have to go through a particular authorization process to get employment. Starting in um, 1986 with the Immigration Reform and Control Act, the country put in place, Congress put in place something called employer sanctions policies, which for the first time actually made it illegal to hire an individual who did not have work authorization. And again, that person who doesn't have work authorization may or may not also lack legal presence to, to be in this country. And so what that created was a whole site of enforcement that really got concentrated at the workplace. So since the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act, which was also the same year that we had our last major legalization um, policy, we've been talking a lot over the last decade about potentials towards a mass legalization or some sort of pathway to citizenship for the population of individuals who are here. That process now is over 30 years old. The last time we did something like that was in 1986, and the compromise for that 
um, amnesty, as it was called, was this employer sanctions policy. And so what that did is it created a whole apparatus on the left side of this screen that really framed the immigrant workforce in particular, but the immigrant population more generally as potential deportable aliens. And these immigrants are subject to these immigration sanctions. They become surveillance targets and the employers who are being tasked with checking an individual's work authorization, that form I-9 that every ILR student knows about because you have to take HR and you learn about this, but also um, most of us who've had to get a job have had to fill out something that looks like this to show that we have work authorization. That then becomes a really important tool for not only large scale um, enforcement actions like we've seen in the news, but also every day, what I'll talk about in a second, silent audits and bureaucratic um, enforcement actions that go through the workplace and use that workplace bureaucracy to identify people who may be subject to removal. Not only the um, De uh, Department of Homeland Security, which was split in right after 9-11 into the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service, which provides services to help um, move people into different statuses, um, but also the Immigration Customs and Enforcement Agency, which we hear about in the news, which is the primary boots on the ground doing enforcement actions in communities, really terrorizing mostly low income black and brown communities, but also the US Border Patrol, Customs and Border Protection at the borders, and a whole range of other programs, including the Social Security Administration, are all working together in that federal realm to surveil um, individuals who may be subject for removal. And what we've seen over the years is that the way in which we prioritize individuals has changed, but that core bureaucracy remains. So that's one aspect of the federal government. There's this whole other aspect of the federal government, which also my ILR students have become very familiar with through their labor and employment law classes, is one that sees their main aim as focusing on individuals who um, are subject to labor and employment protections. In other words, these are folks who are not only a vital part of the labor force for various industries in particular, upstate New York, for example, you might think of dairies or other farms that rely on migrant labor, but also see them as a particularly vulnerable group um, that they have to reach out to in order to um, comply with their regulatory uh, mandates to enforce things like minimum wage, health and safety, um, anti-discrimination policies, et cetera. So these two policy arenas, for the most part, are working in parallel. Um, and although there are memorandum of understanding that are supposed to keep one from getting in the way of the other, we see that in practice that really doesn't work. And so what I am interested in and what Professor Griffith is interested in is how this ever-expanding immigration bureaucracy really gums up the ability for us to protect low-wage workers. And because in this country, most of our ability to engage in that regulatory behavior is based on the claims of individuals. In other words, our ability to hold employers accountable is based on an individual's ability to come forward. We are interested in this not only for the well-being of low-wage immigrant workers, but also compliance at the sector level as a whole. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I want to start also by thinking about the state government um, writ large as playing a really important role in shaping inequality and, and worker precarity. Those of us who are trained as sociologists often focus on not only an individual's human capital or the tools that they bring into the labor force themselves, but also what is the institutional structure that they're subject to, right? And so one of the things that we theorize in this work is that this employment regime that the federal government and increasingly state and local governments as well are a part of, they really play an important role in shaping inequality and worker precarity. And we wanna emphasize that this power is both coercive, in other words, we see this in the news, we see the, the mark of police and law enforcement and even the US military at the southern border as being that coercive arm of the state, but it's also bureaucratic. It's the death by a thousand cuts. It's the everyday aspect of engaging with a bureaucracy that is established to surveil you. And we want to argue that employers end up playing a really important role as extensions of the state because they're required by law to ensure that everyone who they employ is authorized. But we also, what we'll talk about here, um, is that the pressure of the state 
on employers to comply with immigration policy has downstream effects on immigrant worker precarity as well. And we're going to talk about this one category of workers, which has been in the news, especially this week because of the um, ongoing efforts to dismantle this program, the Temporary Protected Status um, Program, which just lost a, a very important law case legal case in the last couple of days. Um, these temporary protected status workers are individuals who have access to temporary reprieve from deportation and have in the case of Salvadorans, for example, for two decades, but are also subject to a number of different bureaucratic requirements that will argue also impacts their ability to, um, to get a job, hold a job, and are faced with disadvantages in the labor market. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And I'm going to say that this is all happening in a broader context of immigrant worker precarity, where it's not just immigration policy, but it's also especially in the current recessionary moment, the fact that we have this widening, widening inequality gap, the fact that I'm sitting here talking to you as a professor who's still gathering a salary from my home at very low risk for um, getting sick, is, that, is in complete contrast to the low wage work Workers, for example, on our campus who are cleaning dorms or working in the dining halls or our, our colleagues who are on um, farms further upstate, right? And so that widening inequality gap is part and parcel of this phenomenon as well and something that um, we, we don't want to lose sight of, right? This isn't just a conversation about immigration, but it's also the case that the state's ability to enforce all those protections that I just mentioned in which ILR students spend a whole lot of time learning about has become increasingly eroded as the market has become deregulated, right? And the state's ability to enforce protections, even though on the books we have far more protections than we did, say, at the turn of the century, the state's ability to enforce them has decreased both because of litigation and an eroding of those policies, but also just the nature of the types of jobs people have, what kinds of protections they're entitled to or not, whether they're a gig worker, whether they're in their formal economy, et cetera. And finally, what we're going to talk about here is that immigrant workers face varying mechanisms of immigrant worker precarity. It's certainly the case that we spend a lot of time focusing on the specific vulnerabilities that undocumented workers face as they're funneled um, more directly into the deportation machinery. And we have seen a lot of this conversation in public debate. But we as immigration scholars are also interested in the ways in which, for example, guest workers, both high skilled or high wage and low wage guest workers face precarity as they they're tied to single employers. So in order to get either a high-skilled H-1B visa or a low-skilled H-2A visa, you have to show that you have an employer willing to sponsor you. That creates a particular type of immigrant worker precarity because it doesn't give you market um, uh, access to change employers if for some reason things aren't going right. And your ability to hang on to that authorization in the United States is tied to your ability to hang on to that job. And then finally, what I'm going to talk about is even when you delink guest workers from the um, tie to their employer, they're also subject to this really mundane um, bureaucracy that creates a set of confusions and delays that can disadvantage individuals on top of the um, uncertainty about whether or not they themselves will be able to hang on to these protections long term. So that's what we're going to be talking about. But before I do that, I want to take a foray into this realm of intensifying um, immigration enforcement. And again, what I'm going to argue, as I said at the beginning, is this is not unique to the current administration. This isn't something that just started in 2017. It's actually a culmination of tactics over both Democratic and Republican presidencies. And even the previous um, administration under Obama and probably under Biden um, have held on very tightly to certain practices that have created um, a, a lot of worker precarity. Um, and we know that the largest number of deportations cumulatively happened during the, the last um, two presidential terms, right? So what do we mean by intensifying immigration enforcement and what role does the work site play in this? And so I want to say a little bit about um, what we've seen in the news lately. And so the work site is a major site of enforcement precisely because of the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act and because of employer sanctions. And we decided, or Congress decided, that this was something that was going to create um, a, an, a, an ability for employers to not only surveil um, their, their workers, right, because they are in charge of having to make sure that the documents that they provided are facially valid, and that's created a whole host of, of issues. And even though the labor movement originally at the time in, 19, in the mid-80s, 1986, was in favor of these employer sanctions, they've since come around and said, actually, this just creates another 
tool for employers to exploit their immigrant workers. Even though that's the case, it's also this case that increasingly you see a, an investment of resources in the work site as a site of enforcement. And so um, one of the first changes we saw right after the election was the appointment of Tom Homan, who's at the top left there. He was the new Immigration Customs and Enforcement Chief, who made it one of his primary priorities to quadruple the number of proactive enforcement efforts at the work site and to put additional personnel in those enforcement capacity. So we have the discretion of the Department of Homeland Security about where we're going to put resources. In fact, we've seen a movement of resources sources from places like FEMA into ICE, and this is one of the, the things that we saw not only at the southern border, but also an increase of resources in terms of this interior enforcement. We've seen also an increase in a number of targeted raids, high-profile raids. You might have heard, for example, 7-Eleven was one of the chains that was targeted nationwide. And in terms of actual numbers, it wasn't so much a large number of individuals who were um, routed up in, in that particular set of actions, but it was certainly was high profile. We knew who, who these um, convenience stores were, and it was in the news quite a bit. This is happening hand in hand with very devastating um, uh, ice raids that are happening and in mostly uh, meatpacking and other low wage factories across the South where we have the willingness of local um, law enforcement to collaborate with ice. And we see that, um, for example, in, um, the last couple of years, there was a, one of the largest ice raids in Mississippi, which arrested close to 700 individuals. And this has devastating effects, not only on those individuals, but also family members who may be in a, what we call mixed status families. So individuals who may not, who may be out of status, whose children were born here or whose spouses were born here, et cetera. Um, if you want to know more about what this has meant, um, you can go to the Immigration Customs and Enforcement, and they proudly publicize those numbers through their fiscal year reports. Um, and we know that this has had um, a number of different distinct impacts in, in different industries like restaurants. And so what we think um, is important to highlight here is that there's this long shadow of restrictions going back to several administrations. And this creates something that um, my colleague Ming Xu Chen refers to as the second wall, right? So it's not just the wall at the southern border, but it's the second wall that individuals are facing at the interior, and which has received, frankly, a lot less focus. Um, and so I want to say a little bit about what that has meant in terms of labor advocates fighting back um, before I go back to uh, a conversation about um, what this means for workers on the ground. So the labor movement, as I mentioned, in 1986, spent a lot of time really promoting um, the idea of employer sanctions because the idea was that these undocumented immigrants posed a competitive um, threat to the labor movement. And so a lot of effort was poured into deflecting what they felt was the employer as ability uh, or the demands to hire these folks. Um, there's been a complete 180, one would argue, um, since 2000 when the AFL-CAO really largely on the, uh, based on the efforts of immigrant-led unions like SEIU, Unite Here, UFCW, and especially in key immigration um, jurisdictions like Southern California and even New York City, um, really pushing to fight back and reverse this. And so what you see now in the labor movement is an active shift towards um, not only supporting policies that support all workers without immigration, without regards to immigration status, but also creating trainings that benefit not only their members, but also non-unionized members who are increasingly under attack um, by immigration enforcement. And so I, I'm showing you here just two examples of what that looks like. The AFL-CIO, which is the National Federation of Labor Unions, the, the largest national federation here on the left, and I, an example of some of the Know Your Rights trainings that they have done, and also particular labor, central labor councils like the one down in Orange County, you see on the right, um, spending a lot of time educating not only workers themselves, but also employers who may need help knowing what to do if ICE um, comes to their um, private property, right? So um, labor advocates are fighting back, but um, that has been under enormous pressure from an administration that has focused a lot of effort in increasing the resources um, towards these everyday bureaucratic audits. Um, so not just these large scale raids, but also these everyday employer audits um, that go through the IRS records and those of the Social Security Agency. And you'll see that the, the employer sanction provisions not only provide for 
civil penalties, but in some cases also criminal penalties. And you can see here in that second dotted line there at the end of the Obama administration, um, based on our data, those numbers have skyrocketed. Um, and that's a really important um, piece of the of the puzzle here, that even though as a proportion of the total number of an employers who are ever going to be subject to an audit or arrest, even though that number is fairly relatively small, that number has gone up. And the number of civil and criminal penalties and the ability to pursue those means that this does create a, a certain amount of risk aversion on the part of employers that we argue also has downstream effects. And so we see that there's been this spike in worksite arrests similar to the Bush administration, this kind of spectacle um, through these large scale raids that I just showed you some pictures of, but also these audits. And you have both of these things coming together under the current administration. So what does this mean for worker precarity? I want to say a little bit about the impact specifically on worker protections. Um, and without giving you the whole overview of labor and employment law, just point to a couple of things that are important here. One is that the labor and employment regime here, as I mentioned before, is completely claims driven. So it's based on an individual's ability to come forward and say, hey, I'm owed those wages um, of, of my hourly pay, or I should not be subject to unsafe working conditions under COVID, or you're required to give me PPE, or no, I don't have to um, uh, sit by while you sexually harass me. All of these things are encoded in the law. But the question is, how do people actually get from a protection that is encoded in the law to actually getting um, some restitution? And one of the major impacts on worker protections, alongside a long-term defunding of these agencies and a long-term um, thinning of, uh, in, in, in many places, the advocacy efforts that are able to actually hold employers accountable. For example, here locally, the Thompson's County Worker Center has, over the last few years, lost a lot of their funding and their ability to do a lot of that advocacy work um, has been reduced. So that we see that in other places as well, current, especially under the current moment. So in that context, if you ramp up immigration enforcement, not only at the work site, but also in the broader community, um, a number of effects um, have been um, notable. One is that the, uh, the anecdotal evidence that we have from employers and other ad employee, um, employee advocates and other lawyers is that more workers are reporting that their bosses are threatening to have them fired. Um, and um, reported to immigration. So this retaliation, which we have protections for in a couple of states, including California and increasingly New York, um, is being challenged by employers who are nefarious and using the um, immigration um, uh, bureaucracy against these individuals. And they're saying, if you take me to court for wage theft, I'm going to report you. And so we've seen reports across the country of that really um, working to silence um, individual workers who might otherwise come forward and speak up. It's also the case that um, we do see Immigration and Customs Enforcement using increasingly um, ruses, in other words, pretending to be um, other arms of the federal government like OSHA, Occupational Safety Health Administration, which should have nothing to do with its immigration, um, and coming in to workplaces under the guise of worker advocacy and then revealing themselves to be um, immigration enforcement. This is not a new tactic. We saw this going all the way back to um, long ago, including a, a high profile um, uh, reveal that happened in 2005 when um, Alex Chertoff first became director of DHS. Um, but we see this also increasing in law enforcement and local agencies um, unable to um, either push back or unwilling to push back. Um, the other piece of this that I think is increasingly insidious is the ability for independent, non-federal agencies to do their work around worker protection. In California, the Labor Commissioner, Julie Su, um, has had to really um, proactively fight against uh, the ICE agents who have come into her courtroom, her hearing rooms, these are administrative law judges, um, while these worker um, proceedings are going on. Uh, we see this in other what we call safe, previously safe spaces like traffic court or family law court. We've seen this here in our own local community, places that the Immigration Customs Enforcement used to deem as safe spaces, along with schools and hospitals and et cetera, no longer being respected. And um, uh, increasing boldness in terms of willingness to um, intervene in um, labor hearings um, and to move forward with um, 
um, enforcement actions, even against workers who are in the midst of filing their claim, as is the case of this undocumented restaurant worker who was arrested during his deposition across uh, against his employer. So all of this has a chilling effect where even though the vast majority of individuals are not necessarily experiencing this because of the, the capacity, it sends a message that workers should be fearful. And increasingly speaking to advocates in our work, um, those are not unfounded fears, okay? So this is despite the fact that we have these formal memorandum of understanding, um, but these everyday discretion that not only the heads of these agencies have, but also the um, institutional culture of the um, Department of Homeland Security and its relevant agencies have really contributed to this anti-worker um, effect. Okay, so in the middle of all this, we have changing immigration policy, and the a lot of the focus um, has been on the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, DACA, especially on our campus, but there's other programs also that really have been at risk. And there have been efforts um, amongst them to terminate the Temporary Protected Status Program, TPS, I want to say a little bit about the impacts of that here today. TPS is a humanitarian immigration program that was um, created to help individuals who were uh, fleeing, for the most part, natural disasters. Um, think, for example, um, the, uh, the, the Hurricane Mitch in Honduras, the major earthquake in Haiti, and one of the largest um, populations was the Salvadoran um, population fleeing political conflict. Um, during the, the 80s and 90s. And so temporary protected status is something that has been around for a long time. Both, both Congress and the executive have the power to create and terminate it. And here we have a situation where one of the first things that the administration did was start an effort to start to, to terminate programs like DACA, which has moved its way all the way up to the Supreme Court. We won't talk about that today, but similarly also TPS, and this was litigated and recently for um, some of the major countries in this lawsuit um, was ruled against in these last few years. And so temporary protected status is really important because it did two things. It provides um, temporary um, deportation relief for individuals and work authorization, not tied to each other. And so one of the things that we're interested in is how does this program actually impact workers' ability to access jobs and also in other parts of our work, which I won't talk as much about today, make claims on their rights? And so the thing about TPS is that it's very variable depending on the country you're from, um, be it um, El Salvador, Haiti, Honduras, um, Liberia, Syria, there's other countries as well, the framework for TPS really differs. And so on average, there are renewals that have to happen and a payment of a fee every six to 18 months. And there's um, a real uh, level of uncertainty, especially in the current moment. And so even though you have what's called an employee authorization card that you can bring to your employer and say, um, I'm here to work, I have legal authorization, what we find is that this, the, the broader level of uncertainty around the program and also just the day-to-day -day bureaucracy of having to um, go through this renewal process and to find an employer who's willing to work with that framework can really disadvantage workers. And so in this work, um, two of the things that I'm gonna talk about today in my remaining time is one, um, what can we learn about uh, how immigration status impacts workers' experiences, even through these temporary programs like TPS? And one of the things that we argue is that TPS is a relatively small program, only about three to 400,000 individuals um, throughout the country benefit from them. However, they are um, in some ways um, real models for what a future uh, legalization program might look like given what we know about the proposals that Congress has um, taken under consideration. And one of the last major um, proposals, there was something called a W visa that would have looked a lot like temporary protected status. And we see a, an increasing move away from permanent solutions and increasingly towards instead these kind of temporary visas. Um, and because of what we know about the problems of linking um, deportation relief from uh, work authorization, uh, because we know that that becomes problematic for guest workers. One of the advocacy um, calls has been to remove that um, requirement. In other words, to say individuals should be able to work anywhere that they want, um, even if they have work authorization on a temporary basis. And that would actually look a lot like the current temporary protected status program. So we think that this 
provides an interesting model to consider what that might look like. Um, and increasingly, we see that the complications that the immigration enforcement bureaucracy provides for workers is clear, right? So workers not only are weighing the, the fears that they may have around work uh, around um, whether or not they're going to lose their work authorizations or just simply their job, especially in a recession, but also what does that have to do with the impact on employers and then in turn workers themselves? So I want to say a little bit about that and say that we are looking at this also from the perspective of um, social scientists that are asking workers and their advocates to talk about the relationship to employers. And I see in the chat there's a question about what this means about actually holding employers accountable and we can have that conversation as well. Certainly this is the case that um, the call from advocates as well is then you have to hold employers accountable and we argue that that might also have some repercussions given the way the current situation is um, set up. So let's have this conversation. Um, a little bit about our methods and how we went about doing this research. Um, we are a team, uh, in my case, a social scientist and um, Kate, a legal scholar, and we were really interested in doing two main things. One is creating kind of an institutional mapping of what the um, context looks like for workers who are not only navigating TPS, but also the workplace bureaucracy as a whole. So we did a lot of work thinking about the changing policies and also talking to folks who are uh, embedded in these bureaucracies. And then we also do a series of interviews with workers and advocates. To date, we've actually done um, over 230 interviews with low-wage um, immigrant workers in the Haitian and Central American community um, across a number of different immigration statuses. But today, I want to focus specifically on the 125 um, TPS workers that we talk to and say um, some about what that tells us in terms of their experiences. So it's been about five more minutes here and then we can take some questions. And I want to touch on a, uh, three themes in particular that we see from workers themselves when they talk about their experience with the Temporary Protected Status Program. And one has to do with this, this thing that we talk often in the, um, in, in, in the broader policy debate in terms of worker fear and uncertainty. And those two things before together, it's not just fear, but it's also uncertainty and what that means as they approach um, their employers. And so some of the advocates we talked about um, said that many of the workers they connect with um, see this as a, um, a very short term prospect, right? And so many of the employers don't want to hire someone who, as one likened, is like a carton of milk. You have an expiration date. So if you're an employer and you have um, certain labor force that you're trying to construct, hiring individuals who have this temporary um, expiration date and which might create an additional hassle for your HR bureaucracy disadvantages their ability to get hired. And so that's something that was important for understanding in terms of why work authorization alone didn't necessarily give people equal opportunity in the labor market. Um, we also had an advocate who talked about um, the fear that was wrapped up in the actual process of obtaining TPS in particular. Um, there's a vast amount of information that the government has with these um, precarious or what some call liminal status individuals, including DACA recipients and TPS individuals. And so they've handed over their information and oftentimes the information of their family members. And so many individuals were very much uncertain about what the future would hold for them. And that shaped the kind of decisions that they made at the workplace um, in terms of the ability to to complain, et cetera. Um, another government official that had uh, that represented a large um, TPS community um, in Brooklyn also talked about um, the impact this had not only on the worker advocacy realm, but also other realms of the government where people, um, as we see now, oftentimes felt that providing any information um, about themselves and to any government official, even if they had nothing to do with immigration, could be um, risky. And so this is important, I think, simply to highlight that these are all things that in some ways they have in common with the undocumented population, but with the added fear that their information is already in the hands uh, of the government in a very systematic way. Now, let me say a little bit about the complications we have for employers and to preface this by saying we are not arguing that employers should be taken off the hook or that we shouldn't be focusing on compliance, um, not only in terms of labor and employment law, but also immigration um, uh, enforcement, um, but that 
certainly that there are um, collateral um, impacts of this enforcement that focuses on the work sites. And I think those are just important as an advocates to confront when we're thinking through the calls to um, increase worker justice. And so two of the things that we heard um, brokers who interface with employers often say is one that the policy and predictability of TPS, not only because um, different administrations, but also different proposals to extend TPS. So every time a, a TPS um, country is provided an extension, there is a kind of long wait of anticipation about whether or not they will go through. But every time that happens, it means that uh, workers are unable to say with certainty about whether or not their renewal will go through. And so someone is trying to get employment somewhere, they're unable to tell the employers how long they're going to be there, not only because they don't know if their specific renewal will be approved based on their own situation, but also because the program itself is in limbo. And so this creates a type of hiring disincentive for temporary workers. And as one advocate for Haitian TPS workers said, if you're trying to get a new job, and let's say you have four months left on your work permit, a new employer might not hire you because they see that you only have a short amount of time left. And so these are arbitrary deadlines just based on when you come in and out of the labor force and when um, your renewal is up. And so kind of thinking through job persistence becomes really important. And actually convincing that the employer that even if the program is renewed, that that gap between when that's announced in the Federal Register and when someone gets their new EAD became a, a source of confusion along with this short-term turnaround. And so we also heard a lot about um, this confusing and delayed paperwork that created work interruptions for um, TPS migrants. And so many talked about how as their deadline came up, um, they were, um, oftentimes asked to stop work because technically if they haven't um, re received reauthorization, they can't continue working. And even if they had reauthorization, uh, HR bureaucracies weren't always um, willing to accept something like a, a government um, announcement versus the actual authorization card. And this created a kind of perverse effect with as low wage workers had to stop work, their ability to gather the, the money to pay the $500 fee to renew was also interrupted. And so you see that individuals often have gaps in their, in their um, renewals just because of the, the finances related to it. And finally, it really meant that um, um, workers were dependent on employers for discretion. And so being able to get employers who are willing to work with you or willing to take a call from a lawyer who could vouch that the program is still in existence and that they were in compliance was really important. So those connections in a place, especially like New York City, where there was a strong um, advocacy community became important. And you can imagine that these um, are thinner in other places. And so employers become a target of surveillance. And it's not that we are arguing that that perhaps isn't appropriate in some contexts, but that it has downstream effects. And so creating um, costs for employers who may have a certain amount of risk aversion, right? So employers interact not only with the enforcement um, wing of the immigration state um, in terms of actually carrying out the sort of deputy, the, the, the work of immigration enforcement, but they themselves are also targets of surveillance and they are risk averse and don't want to be subject to fines. And we've seen some high profile examples of that. And this really has impact on whether or not they hire individuals and in some cases effectively fire them. And this is something that especially at will workers, those are workers who don't have protections of a labor union are particularly vulnerable to. And the costs of uncertainty around the program become very high for their workforce. In other words, maintaining um, a workforce that is authorized becomes important for certain segments of the, of the labor force and certain employers who are wanting to avoid these penalties, um, which can be um, quickly compounding and very expensive. So conceptually, what we simply want to argue here and what we want you as students and other um, individuals who are working in this arena to kind of think about is what does this tell us about worker precarity and the immigration state? It's not simply that the deportation regime is at play in these very visible ways at the southern border or even through these large scale raids in neighborhoods at workplaces, but also the everyday um, bureaucracy of how the immigration enforcement apparatus is constituted with employers is complicated, right? And it's the fact that employers are not only extensions and can use this in very nefarious ways, and we see lots of examples of that, but that as targets of this surveillance, employers become themselves 
um, subject to having to make certain decisions that have negative consequences on, on employees and can create worker precarity. And so just as we think through what are the things that put workers at risk, we want to keep in mind these various mechanisms. And much of what we focused on here has been on employment stability. Can you get a job? Can you keep your job? Um, do you have to be fired for a while before your employer lets you get rehired, et cetera, et cetera, but also has long-term effects for wages, occupation mobility, and we argue also claims making. So we want us to be thinking through employers as playing these dual roles and also the way in which state surveillance and coercion operates also outside of the workplace. So this is none of this is happening in a vacuum. So what does this move mean moving forward? A lot of our future research, we think, um, should be focusing not only on the, uh, as I mentioned, the deportation apparatus and undocumented workers, but also on other categories of workers that may be sliding in and out of that undocumented status or um, have a lot of uncertainty regarding their uh, their future uh, immigration status. So you may be documented now, but it's unclear whether or not that program will persist from administration to administration. But also we argue that um, we have to also think through what are the uh, effects on other areas of regulation beyond the workplace. And so much of what we talked about in our interviews with folks wasn't just what was happening at the work site, but what did especially for low wage workers who were having this uncertainty around um, their job, what does this mean about their ability to go out and seek help with other arms of the government that might be what we think of as more benevolent, um, like social services, et cetera. Um, so we, I think as, as as social legal scholars have been looking at this at the work site and in terms of individual workers, but also in conversation with organizations um, who are at the front lines advocating on behalf of low wage TPS workers like the National TPS Alliance. I also want to recognize my colleague Patricia Campos Medina, who is a uh, the co-director of the ILR Worker Institute, who's been doing a lot of this work both in her own personal research and as a part of our team. Um, and I am happy to take questions. I think we're at about 45 minutes. Um, and thank uh, the ILR School and my co-author. And let's see um, what we can talk about now. So I'll hand it back over. I think who is our moderator, Eleanor? I think that's me. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, yes, I'm I'm Eleanor Painter. Um, also working with the Migrations Initiative and collaborating with Wendy Wolford on the course that's connected to this lecture series. So I'll moderate the Q and A. Um, thank you so much for this talk. I feel like we have such a, um, you, you've offered such a, um, a rich way of understanding what's going on really right now, but also I think um, pointed to some important um, things to hold in mind in terms of how we put what's happening now under the current administration in perspective with what's happened over the last 20 or 30 years, um, which I really appreciated hearing. Um, we have questions coming in, and I just wanted to remind those of you in the audience that um, you can use the Q&A function, and we have this feature activated where you can also put a little thumbs up next to questions you hope um, we definitely have time to, to engage. So feel free to post your own question or give a thumbs up to one that you really want to hear answered. Um, and I will um, get us started while, while a few more questions come in. Um, I guess to open up the discussion, I wanted to give you a chance to comment on the ruling that came out on Monday. Um, and you've offered a lot of perspective on, on the fact that this, this ruling, so a federal appeals court ruled that the Trump administration um, acted within its authority in terminating TPS for, my understanding is for around 400,000 people. Um, and of course, this isn't the first time that this has come up. Um, and you've mentioned, um, you've talked a lot about the effects that this has both on the workforce and the workplace, but also on families and communities. So I wanted to give you a chance to just say more about that in this particular moment, if you wanted. And I also, um, I just find myself wondering, um, are there examples? I mean, this is, this would be, so having 400,000 people who must now voluntarily leave or face deportation um, represents such a rupture. And I wonder, is there an example of, um, of ending TPS that didn't involve this kind of rupture? Or is that just inherent to the status category itself, that it will always involve this moment of imminent deportation? 
Thank you, Eleanor. And now is a time for full disclosure that most of the questions I see coming in are from my legal colleagues and I am in fact not a, a lawyer. So I will tread carefully in my responses here and commend to you the work of my um, colleagues, Stephen Yeller um, and Beth Lyon, who are at the law school, who also, whose scholarship also focuses on a lot of these issues. Um, okay, well, I think in terms of the, uh, the court ruling, um, my understanding is the court ruling was not, did not encompass all the countries that were um, affected, but I don't know that there is an in independent litigation um, moving to restore that for those groups. And so um, I would encourage people to, to take a closer look of that. But I think there's two, two questions that you pose around this that I think are important to focus on. One is um, what does this mean, right, for, for the population and did it have to be this way, right? And I think the question of what does this mean is, is a thorny one because it may actually mean different things for different populations of temporary protected status individuals. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the questions that I see here referred to um, the, the general category of shithole countries that the, the, uh, the president um, referred to many of these affected um, individuals. And I think that not all of those countries uh, represented in the TPS category um, have a, the same relationship bilaterally with the United States. So one of the questions I think is gonna be important is how will the deportation machinery operate um, bilaterally between the United States and countries like El Salvador. We do see that the Salvadoran government has had a, a somewhat, um, uh, I think what we, we might say, um, sympathetic relationship with the US government in terms of facilitating those deportations. And especially in the current era where we see people being deported under really horrendous conditions in terms of the public health crisis, Bukele has not um, been a particularly strong advocate for those deportees that are going back. And some of the work by um, my colleagues like Tanya Golashboza has looked at what those bilateral relationships mean in terms of the actual physical deportation flights that are headed back and what that means for folks who um, are, are going back to a country that they may not, not have known for decades, right? And so the role of the sending state, um, as we often refer to it, or as the origin country and what that government um, decides to do in collaboration with the, uh, the US government in terms of facilitating deportation, but also in terms of welcoming individuals back home, what that advocacy looks like, I think may vary um, from, from place to place. Um, I think in terms of the impact, it's important not to just focus on the individuals themselves. So many of these individuals who have TPS may be married to spouses who either have even more precarious status, so no status at all, um, or who have other forms of status, um, who, but which nonetheless don't necessarily give them a pathway to permanent citizenship. I think one of the um, efforts on the part of advocacy groups like the National TPS Alliance and others like Alianza Americas has been to really provide um, encouragement and resources for people to be able to go through comprehensive screenings to see if there are other forms of immigration relief that people may qualify for. And so that is really a question not only of the law, but really the ability to provide access to justice for immigration legal services to screen people who would otherwise not have the resources to do that. So there may be another form of relief and that really may vary from, from place to place. But what's important to, to note is that the um, current system does not provide an easy jump from TPS to a permanent pathway to citizenship. That's not how the program was ever set up. But there may be individual forms of relief, but we really would need to invest in the immigration legal services to help get people that. But it's also, it doesn't have to be that way. Congress could rule, you know, or the president could decide that there is a, a more permanent solution as they've argued. One of the other questions that I saw is, are there other um, types of programs that are like this, like the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival Program? There's nothing to say that this has to be the pathway. There certainly could be either a more comprehensive set of policies that provide a pathway to citizenship for a certain category of individuals or specifically for TPS. And so that, that becomes a, a political and a congressional um, kind of gridlock question. Um, I, I think that certainly there also have been other countries for which TPS only existed for a short period of time um, and you only see some small cohorts of individuals who benefited from that and that really creates a bifurcation within those communities of folks who either had access to a program that doesn't exist and were able to 
to transition or who were removed. I think it's important also to note that TPS and DACA, you asked if there's other programs like this and, and someone else did. Um, and it's not just these kind of high profile programs, but there's these everyday forms of temporary reprieve that Stephen Yaler writes a lot about um, uh, in terms of regular deferred action, Shoba Wadia is another um, uh, Penn State legal scholar who writes a lot about this, that the immigration bureaucracy has the ability to provide discretion around and who it has very similar features to this. And so when we talk about the TPS population, when we talk about the DACA population, they are certainly some of the largest communities of groups that are facing some of these challenges, but there are many others who, because of the discretion that they have, that immigration officers have to provide temporary reprieve may face similar challenges. And I think as we're thinking through solutions, um, we should be thinking not only how can we fix this specific program, but also this broader category of individuals and not just workers who may be facing, facing similar liminal um, uh, challenges. Thanks. Um, you also touch on, um, when you mention especially maybe congressional action, um, you touch on what Steve Yaler has asked here, um, but I wonder if you wanted to add anything to that answer. So he's asking, what recommendations do you have to reduce the precarity that many immigrant workers have? Um, and it sounds like you're saying some of these um, more major reforms would be necessary to do that, but do you have other thoughts for that question? Sure. I mean, so I would say a few things here, and, and these are not, none of them are million dollar solutions, right? They, they all will, will require some um, coordination with other solutions as well, because I think on the one hand, um, providing a comprehensive solution for individuals who either are undocumented or don't have a pathway to permanent citizenship, either a large scale amnesty tied with a comprehensive program to address the policies and conditions that are creating this exodus of individuals who don't feel safe or secure enough to stay in their countries. This is a long-term structural um, set of solutions that we have to think through, right? Um, if we don't want to keep revisiting this, this conversation and it's tied to what we know about um, ne neoliberal policies and capitalism and the increasing militarizations of the border. Those are not easily encapsulated in one kind of bulletproof um, policy prescription. However, I think it's important not to essentialize immigration status as the only issue driving the precarity that these low wage workers face. In other words, in fact, we talked to many individuals who had transitioned from undocumented status at some point in their lives to TPS. And in some cases, even we also talked to people with legal permanent residence and even citizenship. And even though there is very important qualitative differences in terms of um, the benefits that they were able to access with work authorization, that did not erase the other forms of precarity that they faced as low wage workers who were oftentimes segregated in low-wage industries that had very poor protections in the labor and employment realm, um, no access to, to health insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So if we are interested in the well-being of workers, a lot of what I've talked about here is thinking through the immigration enforcement bureaucracy, but it should also be in conjunction with thinking about what is it about the labor standards enforcement bureaucracy that needs to be addressed? And there I would argue that not only an increasing infusion of resources to major federal agencies like the DOL, the EEOC, OSHA, et cetera, who relative to the amount of resources that the Department of Homeland Security has pale in comparison and that proportion has um, become more disparate over time since these laws were created um, in, in the 30s, right? In the 30s and 40s. Um, but it's also investing in local advocates and that those advocates have to be not only um, immigration legal services providers, but also labor and employment um, um, advocates as well. And we have a, a fantastic clinic here at Cornell um, through the uh, Farm Worker Law Clinic that has to do both, right? At the same time that they are thinking through immigration remedies for individuals, they're also thinking through how can they best advocate on behalf of those workers who may simultaneously be facing other forms of workplace abuse. And for many workers, um, that kind of navigating of the workplace bureaucracy as immigrants who in some cases may even have already been returned to the country of Oregon, origin can really only happen with the assistance of a legal services provider, which the federal government provides no guarantee for. We do have a um, a fairly robust in some places legal aid um, program um, in the country that is, has some federal funding, which has decreased over time, but that actually is not 
available to individuals who are not, who are out of status, who don't have immigration status, and um, often in many places does not serve either immigration legal services or um, labor and employment law very well. And so the access to justice piece of this in terms of the lawyers is important, but also the advocates. How do we think through the role of the labor movement in terms of being able to support workers? One of the things that the ILR Worker Institute has um, looked at, um, and also my colleague Kate Brown from Brenner is looking at, for example, the collective bar bargaining contracts that labor unions have created in, in places um, like Florida, um, Washington DC um, and also New York where you have especially in the service industries hotels for example um, other forms of entertainment that have large um, individuals who have TPS or even DACA those collective bargaining agreements um, have become very important in terms of in institutionalizing protections that workers might not otherwise enjoy so things like how do you regulate an employer's ability to use uh, a tool like e-verify which subjects them to reauthorization in the case of for example a new new ownership and so those collective bargaining contracts can be really important in terms of regulating um, the relationship between workers and employers helping them bring forward grievances and also providing an advocate in moments of uncertainty like um, around a TPS renewal. Thanks. Um, and you've also mentioned that that the potential for advocacy or the, the access to advocacy might differ depending on where someone is. So I imagine there's a, a big difference between what you found in New York City and what might exist um, in more rural areas depending on the on the region. Yeah, um, I, we talked uh, generally today about the New York City region, but one of the um, important distinctions that we made, uh, especially in the Central American community, is between those who are in either the five boroughs or the New Jersey suburbs versus, say, for example, so more urban areas versus, say, for example, Long Island. And so we did also a, a series of interviews with folks in those communities, which tend to be more isolated on a number of fronts, one in terms of just proximity to resources. There are a number of very important advocates on Long Island, but it's also the case that they are much harder to get to, especially if you don't have transportation. Um, Nassau and Suffolk County at the local level have also had very different, even within Long Island, approaches to immigration, especially following uh, some very high profile um, uh, hate crimes against Im immigrant workers or, and, and also the um, collaboration even in terms of the schools with law enforcement with kind of this hysteria around gang prevention and, and MS-13. And so really the local context very much matters. You might remember that one of the places that Donald Trump held one of his stump speeches was in Long Island, kind of referring to this as kind of emblematic of his as attempt to save the suburbs from this throng, these throngs of criminalized um, men and uh, their gangs. And so the the, the national political discussion certainly is permeating everywhere, but it, it does land differently in different places. And so it's the isolation, both phys, uh, physical from resources, but also in terms of the broader advocacy community and the different political contexts that folks are facing. Um, and um, certainly different industries require different solutions. And so we certainly um, heard different types of things from even within a sector like care work, right? So care work and um, domestic labor um, looks very different, say, in an informal um, domestic household where it's just an individual who's working as a nanny, as is the case of many of the Salvadoran women that we talk to, versus say, for example, temp agencies who are hiring out or contracting out more formally. And that creates its own set of employment relations. Um, and depending on where you are, either of those models might predominate. Thanks. Um, let's shift to the, um, the work site. Um, and I want to pose this question from um, Vanessa Olguin, who's a student in the migrations course, um, and who asks with um, multiple thumbs up from others in the audience. So this is the question at the top of our list right now. Um, how often are employers or corporations criminally charged after work raids in which many unauthorized immigrants are found? Is this a considerable number or is there evidence that corporations often get away with both these labor law violations and violations of immigration law? Yeah. I think it's a fantastic question and it's often the question that we get um, from from both advocates and people who have been doing this and it's certainly the case and it depends on how you you know wh what your denominator is right um, and it depends on where in the sector that you sit right and so we've heard that there are 
uh, well, let me just say where you, you would go to get that data, right? So that data is collected by the federal government and you saw actually right after the institution of, uh, of employer sanctions, um, Peter Brown now who used to um, be a colleague of mine at Berkeley and, and led a, a policy research group down in San Diego has done some of this work looking at audits and fines and jail time right after 1986. And you saw this huge spike right after the law was passed and then this precipitous decline, right? And so certainly that's been variable over time. So one, one might be, be to ask, what do we see in terms of change over time? And you saw the graph that I showed you that that was fairly low and then has spiked, right? And that can create a certain kind of chilling effect um, across an industry. We've been in touch, for example, through the ILR Institute with the Hospitality Roundtable um, and many of the things that we heard from in terms of just high profile um, uh, employers in the restaurant and hotel industry really um, having a more, more public face who were concerned of how they may be targeted and used as an example. And so that creates a certain type of risk aversion, especially as you hear that these things are going up over time. But the other question I think that Vanessa is asking is, as a proportion of everyone who hires undocumented immigrants, those 5% of the, of the civilian uh, labor force, and in some cases like farms, 80% of some of those um, sectors, how many of them are really being subject to um, fines or worse? And I think that's a, that's a fair question. And I think that for most industries, this has become, as is the case with labor and employment law, simply the cost of doing business. The probability that you may necessarily be flagged for um, a, 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 an audit is, is fairly low if you look at it in terms of the number of random audits that are happening, but it is increasing. And so there are kind of sector wide, um, I think reverberations that that has. Um, but I think that that is besides the point. It's similar to the question you might, not, might ask you know, and what I often think through is, what are the real chances that someone's going to pick, get picked up and actually deported? And I think that's the wrong question to ask. I think the question is, what is the um, problem, not so much what is the probability that it's going to happen, but what is the possibility that it could happen, right? And it's that possibility that it could happen rather than the probability that it will happen that shapes people's decisions and their fears and their apprehensions and how they deal with varying levels of risk aversion. And so um, this idea of the cost of doing business is what many advocates have become very frustrated with, right? And so this idea that we are holding employers accountable because somehow we'll be able to regulate the demand for undocumented labor, um, I think is a fair one, right? I think it's fair to say that unless you increase the um, cost of doing business, unless you actually have some real teeth behind that, and in some cases you do have examples of that. I think David Abraham had a good example of the post bill um, raid, which happened at the agri-processor agri plant um, over 10 years ago. We saw that um, that was at the same time, that at the time was one of the largest raids in U.S. history um, at a Turkey, Kush, Turkey, kosher turkey processing plant in Iowa was one of the biggest rates that had happened and it was came to no surprise as no surprise to any labor advocates so that was also a place where there had been an ongoing series of labor violations um, after the fact some of the owners of that plant were subject to criminal fines um, and uh, the question is what impact did that downstream have right um, and so this follow-up question I would pose to Vanessa's is not only um, what are the um, likelihood that you're going to get fined, but also if we increase that, will that actually create a aversion to um, hiring undocumented workers? And is that if we are interested at the end of the day of increasing um, worker well-being, if that's your goal, rather than simply don't hire undocumented workers, those workers are here. But if in fact we change the question to what do we do to increase worker well-being and safety and decrease immigrant fatality, right, which is the, the current very real concern but has been for a long time on these really risky unsafe workplaces, um, then that poses a different set of questions. And um, that it's one of resources. And so I think those are really good questions. Um, and there are some analyses that are done by the um, Center for American Progress on this that I would encourage you to look at. Um, and also the Migration Policy Institute has some information on the, the varying levels of raids and fines over time. But what we don't know is whether or not a focus on that enforcement first approach actually has positive downstream effects for workers at the end of the day who are literally dying um, in many of these workplaces. Um, 
thanks for that answer and also for directing us to some of those resources too. Um, I see two questions here that are very different questions, but perhaps both related to wages in some way. Maybe we can take those. So um, one by Beth Lyon, um, to what extent does your research touch on worker experience with taxation or the deployment of taxation in immigrant worker policies? Um, and then we also have a question on remittances, which maybe we can um, come back to after the taxation question. Sure. Um, and I'm going to answer this less from my um, our own experiences with these interviews what, and more generally what I know about what the literature says on this. And um, I would also again commend Beth's best work for you because she happens to study two of the most complicated areas of law, taxation and, and immigration policy. Um, and one of the things that she's referring to is something um, that becomes kind of a double-edged sword for, um, for low-wage immigrant workers. If we look at um, the example, not only of these temporary immigrant programs, but also any immigrant who's going through some sort of immigration proceeding, and certainly during um, 2014, when there was a proposal on the table to create something that might have looked like a larger scale legalization program, uh, the Deferred Action for Parents of American Citizens, um, which would have benefited the parents of uh, legal permanent resident and citizen children. One of the things that you have to prove in all of those proceedings is presence, the, your presence in this country and that you have been here. And one of the ways people often do that is showing that, that they have um, paid into the tax system. And so paying taxes, right, can be um, a really important thing, not only to avoid legal liability, because we're all required to pay taxes, even if even if you aren't benefiting from any of the, um, the, the programs that are supported by those taxes. So undocumented immigrants, it's often said, pay into things like Social Security and Medicare, but obviously um, are not eligible to receive them. But there's lots of reasons why from an advocate's point of view, you wanna make sure that you are up to date with taxes. And even if you are um, afforded some sort of deportation relief, you will be held to account oftentimes for those taxes. On the other hand, taxes can be, um, a liability, right? And so if you are found to have been working um, without authorization and have not paid into taxes, that can also cause a problem for you. But the, but the issue often is how do people actually go about doing that? And there's something called an ITIN, I-T-I-N number that um, individuals who don't have access to a social security number can get in order to, for the sole purposes of paying taxes. And that becomes really important, um, not only in terms of maintaining the public presence and the good moral character kind of provision, but also for the ability long term, if there ever were to be a proposal right, around immigration reform. One of the things that Congress through these um, debates and negotiations have, have said is that they've had to show that you have um, paid your taxes. The issue with taxes also that it is a key aspect of the labor and employment relationship and a key aspect of the immigration bureaucracy. And so those taxes that we pay through our payroll aren't just us paying into those taxes, but also our employers. And many times you see workers who are subject to employment regimes where either they um, are being encouraged to get paid under the table, table in the cash economy for lots of reasons because the employer um, doesn't want to pay their own share of taxes, either into things like workers' compensation um, or the other set of bundle of taxes that, that they need to pay to stay compliant. And so in the process of doing that and forcing a cash economy relationship also means that the worker themselves aren't paying into taxes, which in the short term might seem um, really great because they don't have to take that extra chunk out of their check, but also can become a real problem in terms of documenting the employment relationship in the case of a claim. So certainly in my other work um, in low-wage Work, on low wage workers is an issue that came up not only for immigration um, related issues, but also low wage workers in general. And then you have the issue of independent contractors, which again, I'm also not a labor and employment lawyer, but folks who were misclassified as independent contractors and told that they don't have to um, um, pay into payroll taxes, but then later found themselves subject to self-employment tax. And so there's a whole arena of taxes that become really important. And there's a real inequity that emerges from that, both in terms of the ways in which the employer is able to force a certain um, tax regime on an individual um, because they either want to engage in tax evasion themselves, 
or, or can hold that over the head of someone. I had one worker once tell me about how they had been audited by the IRS for non-payment of taxes and had essentially told the worker that they would be fired unless they came back and paid not only their portion of the um, the tax bill that they hadn't been paid into, but also the employers. Um, and obviously that was illegal, but the the worker um, made the decision long term to um, return back to his country of origin um, because they didn't have some money or the wherewithal to 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 engage in this prolonged battle or have a place to go. And this is, you know, even given that they lived in a in a place with a lot of legal advocacy, the ability to kind of engage in that long term battle um, was was lost on him. And, and the other piece of it that I just want to mention with regards to taxation is that there are a number of different um, tax credits afforded to low wage individuals um, and low wage families that undocumented and other precarious um, or liminal status immigrant workers also um, find themselves missing out on like the earned employment tax credit, which mixed status families should qualify for like the um, current situation with the stimulus that because individuals didn't pay into the tax um, regime don't aren't able to to gather and in some cases like um, someone I know in um, another state um, because they were thought their employer wasn't paying into their taxes and because they had a fraud, fraudulent um, um, tax scenario going on they ended up as workers being the ones who lost out not only on their tax return but also their um, their stimulus. And so there are a lot of downstream effects that I think are particularly important for um, vulnerable immigrant workers who aren't in a position to just call the federal government and say, this is what I'm owed, but who are not in a structural position to be able to remedy this um, in a way um, without the help of an advocate like Beth's, um, Beth's colleagues. And so tax law, like it, labor and employment law, like immigration law are all in the mix here and become really important pieces of how we think about worker inequity. Um, and the, the next question that I see is related to wages has to do with remittances. Um, and I'm looking at Anna Bretman's questions. This is also coming, um, coming to you via the course, the migrations course. Um, considering that a large reason for labor migration is remittances and each group is exposed to different risks, is there an effect of these different statuses, such as TPS, undocumented status, et cetera, on remittances? Um, so I don't know if your work speaks directly to remittances, but if you could say something maybe about the relationship between legal status and remittance um, or how, how we might start to think about that. Sure. Um, I would say that um, certainly immigration status impacts wages. There's no doubt that that's the case on the whole and individual wages um, shape their ability to, to save and send money home. Many of the people that we talked to um, were, hadn't had the ability um, to travel back to see their, in some ways, um, children back in their countries of origin for a very long time. And one of the main ways that they maintained those transnational obligations was through remittances and it hadn't, and in fact, foregone a lot of things for their own well-being to make sure that what they perceived as their family's even more vulnerable status, um, that their needs were met first. And so I think that's a, that's a universal concern. Um, and in some cases, we have even seen that um, remittances can go two ways. Certainly the primary way is that individuals are sending money back to their country of origin, but in periods of recession, uh, the data has shown that there's actually reverse remitt remittances happening as well. Um, and I also think that one of the things that we haven't talked about here, not only in terms of remittances, but debts that are incurred through the migration process itself, um, is is important and can have a lot of impacts on the safety and security of family members left back home who are kind of held to those accounts. So whatever money they had to pull together to help with the um, the journey, and those debts related not only to the migration experience but also other forms of um, obligations that people have to maintain social bonds. Um, become a, a core part of how individuals are making decisions about whether or not they will engage in risky behavior that um, would put their ability to get and keep a job at risk. And that could mean engaging in a labor organizing campaign, complaining about insidious workplace abuse, um, or um, any you know, other thing that would put them in bad favor with their employer. And this obviously has to do with immigration status in part, but not only. And so oftentimes when we ask people about their concerns of um, around immigration, especially undocumented folks, you know, are, are you fearful of, of retaliation? 
the actual greater fear oftentimes was losing their job, right? And what that would mean, not only in terms of their ability to take care of their families here, but also back home. Um, the Migration Policy Institute, again, also has done some really important work looking at remittances um, across different national origin groups. Um, the different sending countries often have programs that are set up to encourage those remittances. So those remittances form a really important part of the GDP of countries like Mexico, who has something called a tres por uno and a dos por uno, both at the federal and state level, to encourage remittances. And so those remittances aren't just going to individual um, families, um, but also to support community projects and become one of the ways that the Mexican government really benefits from the, the labor export regime, that they may not have formally called that for many years, but it, it certainly is, is one of the main things that um, we see as, as an important economic impact in many countries. Okay. I see that we're um, coming up on time, so maybe we can take a couple of last um, quick questions or one final big question. I don't know, um, Shannon, if you saw one in this list that you really wanted to make sure to get to, um, otherwise I can point to a couple. Just want to sure, make sure you're addressing what you see. Um, so, um, let's see, I'm looking through. Um, well, um, You've talked a lot about what you call the cost of uncertainty and also about the connections with, um, well, between risk and um, what we could see as discrimination because of someone's status. Um, I see that Blake Martin has posed a question about attitudes of hostility. Um, and I wonder um, if you could help us think about this for a minute too. Um, so how do the realities of TPS or employment enforcement affect attitudes of hostility? Um, this may be a bigger question than we really have time for, but I think that it's a question also about um, anti-immigrant racism or something that's broader perhaps than um, just the relationship between the employer-employee. Um, yeah. What do you think? I, I, th I mean, I think one of the questions Blake might be responding to are kind of what are the downstream effects, as you will, of having a, a president and, and very prominent con Congress leaders, um, our own, um, congressional leader here locally and others um, adopt an anti-immigrant narrative, right? And so how do we connect that to everyday quotidian experiences of hostility, um, which sometimes even can manifest themselves in, in really um, fatal ways. And so I, you know, I have not necessarily done this work. There's been a lot of, um, I'll tell you where to look for some of this research. Um, some of the research that has been done is by political scientists who are very much interested in how the um, current, how differing presidential administrations have shaped um, public opinion or how public opinion has varied over time. Um, and so that's really interesting to see both the change in public opinion around kind of key policy issues like detention, like deportation, and whether or not we're in favor of, of comprehensive immigration reform. Um, we also, from social psychologists and, and political scientists, have done really interesting field experiments um, with how do we frame the immigration policy debate. And so if we frame it in, in a ways around um, Irene Blumrod and Kim Voss have done this work at, at Berkeley, two sociologists are interested in if we frame it in terms of core American values or if we frame it in terms of economic utility or if we frame it in terms of family reunification, do we set a different tone? And so I think there's more broadly a really interesting um, both advocacy but also kind of political campaign um, research that is done kind of figuring out how you garner support around a particular issue. But I think also the question that you're asking is just this pernicious um, base level of xenophobia that we have. Um, and I would point to two main, um, I think, factors that not only political scientists and sociologists have found through their survey data, but also in terms of what we know over the years, over the decades of our country, you know, centuries of our country's existence, and that the xenophobia that is created um, is proximate to, to two main things. I think certainly one has to do with the, the economic recession. I think that that has kind of fueled a lot of the um, zero-sum game mentality that is in existence in um, in many of these 
many ways also low income um, white rural communities, not to paint a universal brush, but that is certainly part of that campaign. I sometimes um, turn on AM radio to kind of listen to what is being broadcast to, to our neighboring communities. And that's certainly part of the very uh, important narrative. Communication scholars have looked at that. Um, I think the other part of it, though, has to do with the proximity to anti-Blackness. And that's something that we haven't really talked about as much in immigration scholarship, but the way in which both criminality and deservingness get crafted, even sometimes in a very benevolent way, is often in relationship to this country's long history of not only native displacement, but also anti-Black um, um, uh, relations. And so uh, I think that also has to be addressed, which is as we create a more benevolent view of immigrants and one that is more accepting, not buying into these comparisons of deservingness that oftentimes um, reify forms of uh, stereotypes that may um, highlight inherent criminalities of other populations. And we see this not only with the dominant native born population and the white population towards immigrants, but even within immigrant communities themselves. And so I think more generally race relations scholars, um, uh, Jennifer Jones, Hannah Brown, both are, are folks who've studied race relations in the rapidly changing Southern states have looked at this and how this impacts um, relationships at schools and neighborhoods. Um, and Vanessa Rebus, who does work in, um, has done work in the South and North Carolina also looked at this even in terms of work relations on the assembly line. And so part of this has to do with kind of what's happening from above, but also part of it's what's happening in our everyday institutions. Um, and I would say that demography will have a lot to do with this. So the, the way um, we as an American populace are constituted will change over time and certainly these conversations will change, but that alone I don't think is going to um, prompt a um, a, a more productive conversation about the humanity of immigrants in our communities and abroad. Thank you. Um, I think that's the note that we'll end on. I want to thank you so much once again for your talk and also for your generosity with the with the questions um, in this in this last part. Um, and I'll remind everyone um, that uh, you can join us again next Wednesday at three o'clock, and we'll be thinking about the Underground Railroad. Um, and um, migration as resistance. Um, and uh, thanks again, and thanks to you all for your participation and your questions. Thanks everyone, feel free to email me if you have follow-ups and good luck with the rest of our strange semester. Mm -hmm. Take care. <laughs>